Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Megan Brown, and I'm with the Northwest Rett Syndrome Association. Uh, the Northwest Rett Syndrome Association offers connection, education, and advocacy for individuals, families, and communities impacted by Rett Syndrome, mostly in the Northwest. And as part of our commitment to education, we have partnered with Angela Lindig, who is here today to present to us when it is not Rett Syndrome after all. So thank you for much for joining us for our webinar attendees um, and Angela, thank you for being here and presenting to us and I will turn our presentation over to her. Great, thank you, Megan. And thank you everybody for attending. And um, I also wanted to just an, extend a thank you to Dr. Budden who I am hoping is on this call, but if not, we'll uh, hopefully get that message later. Um, as she was the first person that I reached out to when we, um, when we learned it wasn't Rhett after all, um, because she's been uh, a part of our lives for so many years when we thought it was Rhett. So thank you for making this opportunity possible as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started with the, with the PowerPoint, um, which will essentially tell my story. Um, let's go here first and this should also, I want to hide those meeting controls, and then we should also have subtitles automatically generated. So whenever I'm speaking, yes, those should be down below. Um, unfortunately, they're, they're automatic, so they're not always going to be 100% accurate, but it's nice to have those for, for anybody who needs those. Um, I wanted to provide this presentation for a couple of reasons. One, because, you know, after many years of having uh, a diagnosis of atypical Rett syndrome um, and finally getting a, a different diagnosis, I felt that that was an important story to share for others who might be in the same boat. I also felt that it was important to share the um, the reasons we pursued updated testing and um, really hoping that we will have other uh, clinicians or providers who may have families that uh, fit into maybe this undiagnosed or, or um, genetically unconfirmed um, situation and that may be considering how they can share um, this with them and maybe see if they're interested in updating their testing. Maybe it's been many years like it was for us. So I'm going to start from the beginning um, and I'm going to just essentially tell about my daughter and my family and um, when we started this journey. So Amber is 24 years old at this time and um, we began the journey in 1996 very shortly after she was born and we will get into some of the specific things that we did um, over the course of the first 10 years and then what led us to these final um, genetic test results this year, January of 2020. So there's just a whole lot of cuteness in this because who doesn't like to look at a cute baby? Um, I like to share as much of the Amber as I can because she's fun and she's a joy. But let's talk about her early development. So from so this picture that you're looking at right there is four months old and I like to point out that it's completely fake because she could not sit up by herself. She did not have the muscle tone to do that. She, we literally placed her in that seat. They snapped the picture as she was falling down. So we caught her. And so, um, so yeah, she, she did not have any, any very low muscle tone is what I should say. So I didn't know. So I knew um, between two and four months, I had a coworker at two months that said Amber felt floppy, low tone. And um, it took until four months when I was at my 10 year class reunion. And apparently the majority of us had babies that year because there were a lot of babies about the same age. And I could see that these other babies really were doing things that Amber wasn't doing. They were, they were, um, they were strong and she, she was not. Um, obviously just a beautiful baby, but um, uh, definitely not doing the things that she should have been doing even by four months. And so some of the other um, early development symptoms that we started, that we noticed right off the bat was um, the missing milestones. We knew, you know, we were 
she was not meeting her milestones. Head, she had a head lag. I could hold her on my hip facing forward and she kind of would hold herself up, but kind of bobble a little bit. But if I turned her around and she faced me, that head would just fall right back. And that went on until after six, seven months, to be honest. Um, so, and then she was not able to sit assisted, um, unassisted, I should say, before nine months. She did not crawl really ever. Um, she did a little bit here and there, but that wasn't her mode of uh, mobility. And then no verbal language was coming at any, uh, within those first several years. So some of the things that threw us off in the beginning, um, you know, she smiled and laughed on time. She responded to her name. You could see that she made good eye contact. Um, she had slow, slow, slow progress to this day, slow progress, but no, no regression. We did not have a regression. Um, I will show you some video clips as we go through this um, where we had a period, we'd have periods of what seemed like stagnation, but they were short lived. Um, uh, but, but again, then she'd start to make progress again. And then this other weird thing, this arms in the back flip position. So this is really what led us to the very first exploration of anything. Um, at four months of age, I did ask her pediatrician, you know, after that class reunion, we got home and had our four month appointment. And I did ask, you know, what are we, are we, is something wrong? Is, what are we dealing with? And she was great. And she said, you know, there is a wide range of normal uh, in infancy. And, you know, Amber's on the latter end of normal, but, you know, this is still, we've got a little time will tell kind of thing. Um, but between four and five months, we would place Amber under like a baby gym. And she could, um, if we had her in her little carrier, she would try to kick at the, at the items. But if she was flat on her back, she would put her hands back behind her head in like a backflip position as she stared at the, at the hanging toys or objects, like she wanted to reach for them, but she, she couldn't, she, she'd go backwards, like, like when you're looking in a mirror. And so that was what got us that first appointment to a neurologist. So, um, so at five and a half months, Amber did have that first neurology appointment. And let's go to the next slide. And here's where we began our search for answers. So that first MRI, um, did, it, it came back normal. Um, the neurologist at the time, and this is really important. I, I talk about this quite a bit in other things, um, other situations, but he made the comment to us that he had never seen anything like this in his 10 years of pediatric neurology at the time, which was a really, really isolating comment. And um, for, for a new mom, um, and we really did feel like, oh my goodness, we must be the only person in the world with a baby like this. Um, however, it didn't deter us from seeking answers, especially as we reached that, you know, 11, 12, right there at 10, 11, 12 months. By that time we were in, included in the early intervention program and starting to look at potential causes. This was really important to me because I knew in my gut that um, if there was something that we could treat, I, I didn't wanna just wait and see and find out when she was eight, nine, 10 years old that we missed the boat of treatment. So getting an answer for, for us was really important for a variety of reasons. And um, another really interesting thing that happened at that time and being as naive as we were about genetics, I, um, when I was pregnant with my son, who is 16 months younger than Amber, I was about three months pregnant and somebody at the doctor's office had asked me if I was worried about it happening again. And I remember thinking, I said out loud, I said, well, you guys have never seen anything like it in your, in, ever. So how could it possibly happen again? I knew nothing about genetics. I knew nothing about you know, hereditary um, conditions or what we were dealing with. I just knew that I didn't think it could happen again. And um, it didn't with Ryan, he was born healthy without any, any complications. So, um, but nevertheless, we continued with all of these uh, tests, um, trying to find an answer for her very unusual um, presentation. And um, 
this led us to the OHSU uh, ret clinic at just before she was two, I believe. And I wasn't, we weren't made that referral for RET. It was, we made, we were made, the referral was made because Dr. Budden is a, was a develop, is a developmental pediatrician. And that was something we didn't have here in Boise, Idaho, or, and so that referral was made. Nobody was discussing RET syndrome at that point. But when I got home from the appointment and having heard that word, um, the word RET, I then went to um, the internet as it were at the time and started, uh, there was no Google. I went to um, a search engine that existed back then and started finding some stuff information about Rett syndrome. And I thought that might be a, a better fit for Amber and was then called back and said, no, it didn't look like it fit and recognize now this was in 98, 97, 98, and there was no gene until 1999 for Rett syndrome. And so there, this was all based on clinical presentation. And at that moment, she did not fit well enough um, to make that diagnosis. And so we continued down the path of um, possibly having Angelman syndrome, and that seemed like a good fit. And so we tested all of the possible uh, all the possibilities for how Angelman syndrome could happen, and those all also came back negative. So we returned to the RET clinic just before her fourth birthday, and there were some additional things that they were able to observe, and the diagnosis of atypical RET syndrome came at that time. Um, but I didn't like it, <laughs> to be honest, and by now there was a gene and so um, I, I was in a, um, that, that mother emotional state of being where I thought, well, we're just gonna have to prove it then. So we um, ended up doing some new uh, continued searching. We did the MECP2 testing at age five. There were updates to that testing um, that came about which she had when she was eight. We also did um, some additional new MRIs and nerve and muscle biopsies to rule out perhaps a mitochondrial disorder. Um, by the time Amber was seven, I believe, we were at the Northwest Rett Center uh, Conference and uh, Dr. Budden and I stood next to each other as we observed some of the other families and, and the girls. And I say girls because at that, they, they, were all, they were all girls at that time in our group. Um, and uh, so, and I remember Dr. Budden looked at me and she says, I believe it is so. And I said, I believe it is as well. So that was the moment that we sort of had to say, this is where the science is at. This is what we know. She fits here um, for a variety of reasons. We don't have a genetic confirmation. Maybe science will catch up at some point. And so that's where we were. Um, for many, many years. So I wanna show two quick little video clips that um, really helped us to see what those hallmark symptoms were that moved her into that category. Um, number one, this one, I, I'm gonna warn you, um, she's got a pretty high pitched squeal on this one. So you might wanna turn it down for a second. But this one, I, I, I wanted to show because this is where stereotyp her hand movements were really starting to come in. And this was one of those periods of stagnation. She is, she's four in this video, I believe, 99. Uh, no, she's almost four, she's three and a half. So, sorry. Okay, so she she's, has no verbal communication yet either. You could just, the, um, this connects a lot to what we hear in other families, the tantrums, the emotional stuff, the crying that goes on. And she was really going through quite a stage of crying. Um, again, no regression, but the interesting hand movements that were creeping in. And then something else that we found, um, this is about 
I don't have a date on this one, I don't think, but it's not too long. This might be a, between four and five. Um, but what I hope you'll pick up in here is her breathing. Okay, so those were some of those, um, let's see if I can go to the next slide. Oops, I don't wanna play them again, there we go. And then um, once we started going through her videos, we actually discovered that that breathing pattern occurred very early on, well before we even identified anything. We weren't even, we weren't associating that. So in this video, it's, it is quiet. I hope you're able to hear it, but she's we believe she's trying to vocalize but really it is that it is that breathing pattern that is so that's the hallmark symptom of Rett syndrome the hyperventilation that was there and she is not even she's not quite 10 months in this video so hopefully you can hear it okay so I hope you were able to hear that. If not, um, uh, that it'll be recorded. You can turn it up and, and hear it if you if you wish. But um, so sometimes you you know we we just didn't have the knowledge of what that meant until much later. And um, but those were the hallmark symptoms. And by the time she was four, when we had that that breathing that was there, that was certainly not part of Angelman syndrome. And at the time, as far as I know, it was only part of Rett syndrome. So. That was like, okay, she's, she, this is her, this is her, this is what she has. Um, these are just some uh, atypical, what, what brought us to the atypical RET diagnosis, some of her key overlapping symptoms, and then some of those things that made her atypical um, as she got older. I call this picture um, or this collage, just her, the RET pose. Um, we see this, this hand, um, pose this position in many girls and I, um, boys with Rett syndrome. This is the hand wringing and the hand clasping is a very common and, and also another hallmark uh, symptom. The difference is Amber didn't do any wringing and she did not have any loss of purposeful hand use. This, was this is just a common position she's in. Um, other overlapping symptoms, I already said the hyperventilation, but teeth grinding, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Um, feeding concerns, I'm gonna talk about some of these uh, a little bit more in a second. And then obviously without um, what made her atypical was the no regression, no loss of skills, the development of verbal communication that I'll talk about and um, her, uh, her ambul being ambulatory and that came late she took her first steps a month before her fifth birthday. So rather than walking and then losing that, she actually just made that really, you know, those, those slow, slow progress. But um, so why continue the search? Um, the, I wanna tell you a story real quick. Um, so in my work, I didn't mention this. So in my work, I am currently um, the executive director of Idaho's Parent Training and Information Center and Family to Family Health Information Center, which those uh, programs are found in every state. So um, under different nonprofit organizations. So as the Family to Family Health Information Center, I am connected to our Western States Regional Genetics Network and have been attending those annual meetings for about 10 years now. And I got the opportunity in 2017 to go to the, um, American College of Medical Genetics conference, which was held in Phoenix that year. And it's, it's massive, it's beyond massive. I, I've never been to a conference so big in my life and um, every breakout session had over a thousand people. And so it was just phenomenal to get this opportunity to go and hear about just the amazing advances in science and in genetics that have been taking place. And, um, I was listening, I was at, in a breakout session and I was listening to this presenter give this, tell a story about um, a, just a case study, a patient case study where they had, um, they had the, the child's um, 
symptoms, their, their phenotype, you know, all their symptoms and how that adds up. And, and then they did genetic testing. I cannot remember if they did, I, I'm assuming they did, um, well, it could have been whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. The difference for that, for those who want to know, is whole exome sequencing looks at the protein coding genes, um, at, at, which is in the exome as opposed to this every gene and every everything. So, um, but nevertheless, he put, um, he said that, you know, they have these variants of unknown significance that came back and they had, I'm putting this into really simple terms, they have these VUS databases now where they put this variant of unknown significance that came back, you know, this child's got a mutation over here, but we don't know if it means anything. So they put it into this database and lo and behold, two years later, another lab has the same variant come up with some, another person and they have very similar symptoms and then pretty soon there's three, four, five, and they they now know that this is a, a variant that is causing this condition. And he was funny because he said it took two years. And I thought, wow, that was a long, <laughs> he said it was a long time with two years. Um, when I was sitting there thinking, mm, it's been 20, we, we don't have a gene. But I went to, um, I went to uh, a colleague and I said, you know, does it make sense to maybe do some updated testing on Amber? Is she, would it be beneficial to, to get this? And, and she said, you know, there's, you've got to have um, medical necessity for that. And there is a good case for medical necessity with her situation. And so, um, so we did, we went, we got a referral um, I should also say that now there's so many rare diseases due to increased testing and finding more people. And the more we know about rare diseases, the more we know about the, the science that leads to treatment. So, so I'll talk about that right here. Um, so that's the, but what does it matter? And then the next slide will be on medical necessity. So here's the things that I hear frequently from parents and even providers. Yeah, um, for, for the, why, do, why does it matter, right? What does it matter to get new testing? She's 20, for Amber, she's 20, now she's 24, but at the time she was 20. You're just gonna do the same things you're already doing. You're, it, what is gonna change? She's, you know, she's not gonna, um, we don't know if there's anything that could change in her, but science is moving at that breakneck speed. And now we know treatments, and interventions and even cures are on the horizon. And I also argue that this is an important step to clean up the data. When we have people diagnosed in the, let's just say for Rhett, with Rett syndrome, who maybe are not dealing, where they don't have a, 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 a MECP2 mutation, um, maybe they have another condition that needs to be diagnosed so that they can, well, also, for me, it was also about clinical trials. So um, Rett syndrome is moving in the direction of clinical trials actually happening. And as you all probably know, I mean, it, Rett has been reversed in the mouse and, you know, cures are on the horizon. And as I was watching this amazing science take place, I knew that for Amber, even if she was too old to benefit from a treatment, we guaranteed she couldn't get benefit from a treatment because MECP2 was not her gene. And we know that, we knew that even um, from all that other testing. So we, we knew that. And so, you know, could she be, could she also be an answer to another family was important for us as well. And then finally, my, my mantra these days is all boats rise because the, the, um, the science and the treatments and the research that's been done for Rett syndrome and some of these other conditions is the very science that's gonna benefit these new, newly found ultra rare conditions as well. So um, we're all gonna to benefit together by having the correct answers. And then the case for medical necessity, and I gotta watch my time here too. Um, the, the question is, first and foremost, what are the potential health implications that we may learn about if we have the proper and correct diagnosis? I also have a focus um, personally on transition to adulthood and that continuity of care. 
So one of the things that we've learned is our adult providers for um, uh, family practitioners or internists, they don't have the history with our, our kids and our kids' conditions that our pediatricians do. So we're having to, as parents, um, really educate them on what care or a care plan might look like in kids with these rare neurodevelopmental disorders. And um, if we don't have the if we don't have the right information to educate our adult providers to work together, then we may miss something, and um, that could result in um, other health problems that we could have addressed with the proper treatments earlier. For some kids, um, this is about self-determination. So if you don't know personally what your true disability is, it makes it very challenging to advocate for yourself and advocate for your health um, and your health care in the future. So I think that that is something to, to really consider if you're um, just looking at you know, why is it important for um, somebody to be getting tested later if they, you know, had all the testing as when they were earlier, because there may be new things that we are discovering. And then finally, the known treatments and interventions, as well as those that may be coming. So I look at um, spinal muscular atrophy is a perfect example of this. You know, we, this is a condition that when we tested Amber for it, it was um, really, a, a, it was fatal. It was not anything that could be treated and it was, it was going to, it was a fatal condition. And today there are treatments that given at birth will completely alter the course of the condition um, or shortly thereafter birth. There are treatments that can be given to people who are, um, you know, up to, I think even in adulthood, there are different types of interventions that can be given. Um, and in fact, spinal muscular atrophy is now on the recommended uniform screening panel for newborn screening because there are treatments available and you've got to catch it earlier, at earliest as um, whenever possible. And so in time, we're, we're all going to hopefully be in a position that um, these, these rare conditions have these treatments that can benefit children at the first part of life um, to, change, to alter that course of disease. So that is really important. And if we don't have this diagnosis, our, at, if we're not able to get tested, let's just say Amber wasn't able to get a test. Now we know her, you know, th th that found her diagnosis. Well, then you don't know whether or not this is gonna be common enough to, you're not gonna get treatments because people aren't gonna be doing research because you don't have enough patients, right? So, um, so I'm gonna move forward on that. So I'll talk about her, her diagnosis now. So we did get a referral to genetics after, um, after that conversation, after going to the ACMG conference. We were not a priority at 20 years old at the time, 21, by the time she got the referral, um, you know, it is that whole thing. What is it going to matter? She, you're just going to do what you're doing anyway. She's 21. She's not, a, you know, she's not that priority for that newborn maybe who is developing and you need to do some quick testing or that younger uh, toddler. So we waited two years to get into our geneticist and, um, and that was fine. I called a lot. I, I was anxious to, to get in, but I understand the wait. And in many of our states, we do have wait lists for genetic services. And in Idaho, we have one geneticist and currently we're gonna get another one um, in November. So we're gonna have two finally, but we have one. So knowing that there was going to be a wait was fine, but ultimately we got in in September of 2019 and she wanted to do a panel, which is listed here. It's the Gene DX ID Intellectual Disability Autism Panel. And that panel looks at about two to 3,000 genes from my understanding that are known to be causative of um, neurodevelopmental disorders that fit within the autism intellectual disability uh, framework. Um, and so I was a little kind of hesitant. I was a little bummed personally. I kind of I was like, we've waited this long. Let's just do the whole exome sequencing, just get us in there. But I, I trusted her and uh, we did, 
we did um, the panel. Um, others that have our diagnosis, which is, it doesn't have a name yet. It doesn't, we're not, we don't have a syndrome name. We go by just the gene mutation itself, which is the HNRNPH2 gene, which is also located on the X chromosome. And so it also functions, um, it has some similarities in that because it's a, uh, there are fewer boys um, because of, uh, you know, the X chromosome and girls having a backup X and X inactivation and all those things that anybody who's familiar with Rett syndrome is familiar with. So, um, but some of our, uh, some of the families that have received their diagnoses came through, most received their diagnoses, I believe through whole exome sequencing. Some came through Spark for Autism, which is free testing. If you have an autism diagnosis, you can get into that. Um, you can make a request for a kit and you can uh, test just fewer, far fewer genes than these others, but our conditions, I believe both RET, MECP2 and the HNR and PH2 genes are within that, uh, within their testing. And then there is the whole genome project um, that you could look up online. Some of our families have received their diagnosis through that as well. So um, many had um, an autism or a CP diagnosis in our group, if they're older, especially. There are um, currently about 110 cases in the world of our HNR and PH2. And that's another reason why I'm just like, go, if you're waiting to get, if you don't know, and if you think it might be, um, you know, if you've got that non mecp 2 uh, confirmation, consider, it may not be ours. I know other families who have done updated testing who had atypical RET um, cases where they ended up with a different gene genetic disorder, but that goes back to the all boats rise. Let's just find out who's, who really is where. And then, um, so Amber, there are about 81 families that are connected to our group that was formed um, by a group of the first group of parents that came together and created a foundation called the Yellow Brick Road Foundation. And um, they have connected families. Anybody who wants to get connected gets connected through their uh, website and um, the Facebook group. And our geneticist gave me that information as I as we were handed the diagnosis in January. We were number 61 in the world to get connected. And I can only tell you, I have goosebumps just thinking about it all over again, because while a, a diagnosis of either of these conditions at, you know, when our kids are little and we're coming to terms with the um, symptoms and the severity uh, and what it might mean to our, our child and their, their future is really hard. Um, but when, you're, when you've waited 23 years, a month before Amber's 24th birthday to get the final truth, it, I, I cried and I, I just couldn't believe that we actually had an answer and that science really did catch up. Um, so that's been amazing. And then here are some things I just want to talk quickly about HNR and PH2 that's a little different than, than RET. So there are some facial similarities and now I'm gonna show you some of this um, on the next couple of slides that are often not found in RET and, the, and, and not found in Amber. And so she, I did a, a presentation several years ago where I showed some of the facial similarities that I can see in Rett syndrome where Amber looked like a lot of the girls with Rett syndrome. So there are foot and ankle hip variations in our, in our kids that I've never seen in Rett to, to the degree that, I've, that we see them in the HNR and BH2 kids. So I'll show you that. Um, we are finding that there is um, a, visual concerns, including cortical visual impairment that is being diagnosed. It is my understanding that that might not be uncommon in red as well, but it's something maybe an emerging um, issue that you're, you all are just learning about as well. And then non-purposeful self-injurious behaviors. I'm gonna show you some of that. And then finally, music and communication. And I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. So these are some of the facial similarities in HNRNPH2. Um, I have permission to share these. So the two girls on your left both live in Australia and found each other as they got their diagnosis this year. And wow, they have, they, you, you could be sisters, right? 
And then if you look at the six on the left, these are um, other, some of our, our other uh, family members and their kids. Well, not family members, but their kids. Um, one of the things that is common in a lot of these kids is just the um, uh, epicanthal folds at the eyes and um, uh, the, the, the um, wide or broad nasal bridge is common. Um, and then you'll see the, the, the downward slanting, um, there's a technical name for that, but the, yeah, there's, um, but I'm not gonna try to come up with it. It's help for something fissures, I'm, anyway. Um, but you can see the similarities in their, in, in, um, their facial similarities. And again, now I will say this, with the exception of a couple of these girls, um, especially this one in the upper middle, I would not, if I had, if Amber were younger and I had seen some of these other kids with their facial similarities that I didn't see in Amber, I don't know if I would have pursued it. I don't know if that would have been something like, oh, yeah, she doesn't, I don't see that. But what I do see that's remarkable is the posturing and the movement when you see these kids and young adults in action, it's like, whoa, this is, this is exactly where we belong and why we didn't necessarily fit Rhett fully. So this is, this is typical positioning. And we see this, I've seen this, I have seen hands on the ears in Rhett syndrome as well, but it seems to be pretty common positioning in a lot of the kids with HNR and PH2. And then if you'll notice um, in the lower right corner, and these are all Amber, by the way, um, uh, Amber's got her finger, her thumb tucked in her fingers and kind of twisted. That is a really common position that we see hand, finger twisting and tucking in a lot of the HNR and PH2 kids, which was really interesting. Also, um, hands to the mouth, which is a stereotypical uh, movement for Rett syndrome, that was one of the things that we always believed was one of Amber's also her characteristic um, her characteristic symptoms. But her, the, her hands to her mouth looks very different than what most of the girls and boys with classic ret. When I see their hands go to their mouth, it's kind of a, a quick, um, you know, in and out and and kind of a, a a quick movement. Whereas Amber's kind of always got her hands on her tooth or you know up there at her mouth if not in her mouth and biting. So um, hand wringing is very uncommon in our kids and a loss of purposeful hand use is also very uncommon. Now these feet. So, wow, um, the feet in HNR and PH2 are m very flat. Um, there is severe pronation, inward pronation and we have um, a very long big toe um, that you can see and um, very, very lax ligaments, um, low tone. So full disclosure and a lot of um, curling of the toes as well. So this, the first, the top two right on the screen, those are both Amber's feet. And so the, the smallest one there, that's when she was three. And um, the second one is uh, a few years, let's see, I don't know, put her at 13 or 14. And she had already had two surgeries on her feet and they still are pretty significant. And yet it doesn't deter her from walking. So um, these feet are, these feet, I, I can't say it enough. I went to our orthotics doctor and I'm like, okay, if you see these feet ever again, <laughs> consider us, <laughs> consider us, because this is, um, this is so common in the group. Um, and I never saw the feet to be this severely affected as common in, in Rett syndrome. That was another thing that made Amber a little more atypical too. So, all right. Um, I, I should say um, there is hip dysplasia and some scoliosis, and I know those also occur in Rett syndrome, but they are occurring in our kids as well. Back to the vision. Um, so this also goes to the medical necessity point that I tried to make earlier. So by finding this diagnosis, one of the first things I learned about was this uh, cortical visual impairment. And I, I knew about cortical visual impairment, for, but I didn't know the correct information about it at all. And so what I thought CVI was is not really what it 
is and there are characteristics of cortical visual impairment and then there's a range. And so as I looked at those characteristics, I thought, well, Amber has a bunch of these. <laughs> I never would have even thought about getting her looked at for a cortical visual impairment. And to be quite honest, I don't remember the last, I think we saw a, an eye doctor maybe when she was three, there was never any problem with her eyes and CBI isn't a problem with the eyes. So we never went back to an eye doctor until one year ago, right after she got her diagnosis and I discovered this, I said, we're going to an eye doctor. And lo and behold, somebody also somebody who was um, familiar with cortical visual impairment and um, the characteristics well enough to be able to, to give a good exam and give us some uh, good information. So the um, nearsightedness, cortical visual impairment, and strabismus exotropia are, are common in HNR and DH2. Again, I, I know that strabismus and, and um, exotropia, for instance, is also common in, in RET. Um, it, these things are highly common in HNR and PH2. And so there's Amber getting fitted for glasses because she is indeed nearsighted. And we also have learned to make a lot of modifications um, in our environment, in her environment, to help with her visual, um, her focus and the way she processes visual information due to what appears to be a cortical visual impairment. And um, the eye doctor that we saw absolutely said, you know, you're, she'll, she will benefit from those um, CVI modifications. And let me tell you, she has. It's been remarkable to see things that she is able to do that we didn't understand why she couldn't do. And that was, um, so focus. So I have um, been working on certain things. I don't, I don't have videos of this, but we've been working on things with her um, in things that we would have never even considered to go back to. So reading, identifying letters, writing, those kinds of things. She would get things right and she'd be correct. And then she'd just get everything wrong. And it was like, why is there no consistency in her, under, you know, is it, uh, does she not understand what is, what is happening? Well, ultimately what we've learned is for her, it's, it's um, likely caused by visual fatigue. So I now know, I've just recently gone through um, flashcards that are, that are um, very, clear of clutter and I can do five at a time of the alphabet. If I do more than five, I lose her. But if I can do five in a row, she can stick with me and she'll get them right every single time. She, and it doesn't matter what the letters are. But if I try to do six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, pretty soon everything's just F or T. And so she's, she's not able to stay focused and process that visual information any longer. And knowing that has been phenomenal to helping her become more successful in her future. So, um, and it's been fun, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, so sensory issues and feeding problems, again, common in both conditions and across other neurodevelopmental conditions as well. But um, the sensory issues that we see a lot in um, our kids with HNR and PH2, that is maybe a little more atypical, our related to that, um, the visual perception and where they're processing information. So that characteristic of um, not, not being, able, no depth perception, like Amber can come to a curb and if there's a, if there's a, if there's a yellow stripe on a road, she'll try to take a step. She'll try to find that step. Um, and then even when stepping down from a step, she does not look down she, and requires that help to step down steps because the visual is processing information isn't there. And you can see how much she absolutely adores being on a slide. Um, <laughs> she, she hated it and it's because she doesn't know where she is in space. She really just doesn't have a sense of where she is in space. And to this day, um, she doesn't have that sense. I mean, she can walk and she's you know mobile, but short distances and we have to be hands-on, be right there. Um, she does not want to fall and she is afraid of falling. Um, so, so those sensory issues are, are there. Feeding problems, I think in both group and in other conditions, you know, we definitely have our fair share of kids who have um, problems with texture, swallowing and um, use tube, they're tube fed, et cetera. So, um, and we definitely had those problems early on. Um, and 
Amber, Amber was considered for a tube between the ages of about four and five, and then she started to be able to handle more textures. Um, it's still not great. Uh, she will swallow things whole, so we have to be careful. But anyway, that's, a, that's something that, common, that overlaps. And now this one I do not believe overlaps. So self-injurious, non-purposeful self-injurious behavior. I'm gonna show you three things here. Um, the, set, the middle picture is really one of those CVI modifications where we've got her in a dark space to, to do learning with, with a backlight. Um, but I brought this picture in because you can see I have a, there is a soft neck brace on her. And that is what we're having to use for this behavior. So you're gonna see a short video clip of this. So, oops. so that is compulsive um, and it is all day long and it has come about over time. She did not start squeezing her esophagus until around high school. I remember because it was a behavior that we had in her IEP to try to get her to um, not do it. And then we realized this is not a, this isn't a behavior you can have a goal around. She can't, she cannot control that. And it's like the breathing, it's like the other things, you know, it's gonna, um, we just have to redirect and then find interventions that can be helpful. And so the neck brace is what we use um, to slow her down so that she doesn't, because she'll leave bruises on her neck and it's really, it's really quite dangerous. Um, I haven't seen another one of our kids have this specific behavior and I hope and hope and hope that we find a way to um, end it. <laughs> I'd like it to go away as it came on, but um, time, time will tell about that. And then the other thing that is common in our situation is the, the hand biting. Um, I took this picture two nights ago. Amber's hands are terribly destroyed. I know that girls with Rett syndrome get those calluses and such from, from the hand wringing that can be so severe, but um, our kids um, often have um, biting behaviors that are, are just um, really, really difficult to manage. And um, so some will use splints, like, you know, um, Amber would not put up with that for anything in the world at this point, but we just try to help her keep her hands down and keep her occupied because when she's occupied with her hands, she doesn't squeeze her neck or bite her hands. But um, that can happen when she's excited or angry or just randomly. Um, and we do see that pretty common um, in, in many of our kids, even in, in a but more so as they get older and into adulthood, which is something that we hope we will find treatments for. And then I know I only have a couple minutes, but I do want to tell this quick story. So music, music communication and verbal language. And this is really something that truly set Amber apart and made this atypical Rett syndrome diagnosis. So con um, it, was, it was the one thing that was like, well, then what? It, she has verbal communication and she developed verbal communication over time. And um, that is not something that we see in, in RET as far as I know. I know that there are some kids who have preserved speech um, and there may be some who do um, develop, but it is really highly uncommon. So, um, so I'll tell my butterfly story. What happened was we discovered when Amber was four, um, just before she was four, she had gotten into a new therapy program um, for developmental and speech and OT, et cetera. And I came home, it was maybe the first week that she had been attending. And I picked her up and the, the therapist said to me, she's so cute. She was singing the ABC song today. And I said, ah, and then we got home and I said to my husband, they're so sweet. They think she's singing the ABC song. And, um, it wasn't very long after that all of a sudden we could hear her humming these tunes and we're, she is humming the tune to the ABCs and she is humming tunes to different things. And it was adorable, but we thought, what are we gonna do with this? You know, this is just cute, but what do we do with it? It, didn't, it wasn't verbal language or anything at that time. It was just humming the tunes to songs. So when she was six, she went into the hospital for the first time for her first uh, bilateral foot surgeries. As you can see, she's there, there in her hospital bed with her lovely cast up to her uh, hips. Um, and her service coordinator had brought in this big mylar butterfly balloon. And Amber looked up at the balloon and immediately began humming, humming the tune 
to a song that was on one of her computer games called Watch Me, Watch Me Flutter By, I'm a Lovely Butterfly. And she just sang the tune and her service coordinator and I both about dropped to the floor because we both realized at that very moment, this is communication. She just labeled something using music, um, not a word, but music, the tune to tell us that's a butterfly. And that is where music became integrated into every bit of her therapies. And it was with music that verbal language began to emerge. We would, we would hum the tune to a song using different vowel consonants um, and then we'd fade it back. So if we did ba, 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 she would wait and see if she would attempt the next one with the same vowel consonant or consonant vowel and she did uh, over and over. And um, so between six and 10 verbal language began to come and today she is incredibly verbal. Um, she has a lot of words and her language is sometimes um, uh, not always, um, so she will, she will say things to us the way we ask questions of her and we're still working on turning some of that around. So like if she wants to watch a movie, she will say movie do you want? And so we're still working on may I have a movie please? But she will string together you know, whole sentences, movie lines and music. And, and so, um, and that really is something that is also found in HNR and PH2. She is not the only one to have developed verbal communication or, or had, had words through music before any verbal speech came. So um, uh, that is pretty much the end of my presentation. I did want to show you, um, since I have a minute, I wasn't sure if I was going to show this, but I will show you. This is where her music sort of began and with words. I think she's seven here. And okay. So I just wanted to share a little snip of that because you can see in that slide where she's not really saying the words, but she's finishing it at the end. And that is, um, that is really how her verbal language came about. So in conclusion, these are, this is a stack of Amber's medical records that I had put together as soon as we got her diagnosis. And um, I just want to say too, there is, there is legislation that is somewhat stalled in, um, in Congress right now. It's been sitting in the House of Representatives since August of 2019. And it's called Ending the Diagnostic Odyssey Act. And this is a quote that is um, within that legislation. It says nearly 80% of all rare diseases have a genetic cause and half of rare disease cases impact children. The average diagnostic odyssey can last anywhere from five to seven years. You can imagine the anguish of parents watching their children suffer, watching them endure one test after another and the toll this takes on the family, emotionally and financially. It is a great travesty in an age where comprehensive genetic screening is available and affordable. Whole genome sequencing will, be, will alleviate an enormous part of a huge burden these families carry. I am um, a very strong proponent of um, hope uh, of ending the Diagnostic Odyssey Act and, and getting that legislation passed. I recognize that um, whole exome sequencing is still expensive. Um, compared to other tests, are uh, it's an, uh, around twenty five hundred dollars still, um, and getting it paid for through in getting the testing, you know, having your insurance company or Medicaid paying for these tests, you really do have to have um, a valid, good um, reasons for doing so. I know that the the test that we did was, um, I believe it's about six hundred, but it's you know if, if it's not one of the conditions that's found on that panel then you know it's just one more test. Um, so with that, I know we're right at about five minutes left. I will I will stop. I'll stop sharing my screen and look for any questions. Thank you so much, Angela. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, attendees, if you do have any questions, there is a QA box at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, you can ask questions directly to Angela and then she can answer them. I know that there was one question in chat about 
let me see, uh, a rare genome project that you had mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd have to, I turned off my other system, but you can look up rare genomes project and, and go there and it gives the um, criteria for who is eligible for um, their testing. And maybe I think it also gives, um, there's some FAQs there on what they, what they're, what the project is about. Um, and the, I think also the timeline. Some of these really can take a long time. I know even Spark for Autism, if you submit that, I think sometimes it can take a while to get those results. But, um, you know, if you've been waiting for a long while at this point, that's, that's maybe worth at least trying or pursuing, especially if you're looking for something that's free or at no cost. There's also research. I don't have it in front of me, but there, there is a, um, there is research happening all the time where, I mean, Amber, a lot of her testing was done through various research projects where we didn't have to get, get it paid for. It was just simply draw blood and send it to a, a lab that's doing research. So if anybody wants information on that, um, they, should, they can certainly reach out to me and I can dig up that info. Okay, and then Trish Flanagan in the chat had recommended that um, if you think your child or any atypical Rett syndrome patient may be similar to Angela's daughter, Amber, please go visit ybrp.org and find them on Facebook, uh, the Yellow Brick Road Project. I also wanna point out too, for any clinicians or providers that um, just happened to get this uh, presentation forwarded to them. Um, consider those kids that are in your, in your practice too, that maybe have an autism diagnosis or CP and autism. Maybe, they're, maybe they are, um, maybe they're not in the RET diagnosis or anything else, but maybe they haven't had any updated testing and maybe that would be something the family would be interested in. Um, because like I said, there's, there's a number of these conditions happening and, or, you know, that being found and the treatments are coming. I, I also want to say too, as far as the treatments coming, I spoke with a doctor about potential, um, potential uh, treatments that may come for HNR and PH2. And I asked point blank, will Amber be too old? If clinical trials come down the pike, will Amber be too old? And um, I was told, probably not, <laughs> probably not. There, it's just like with SMA, you know, there are certain treatments. Am I gonna have a cure? No, no, of course not. We're not gonna have that. But could we see what we call a gain of function? Could we get rid of the self, could we get her to stop grabbing her neck? Can we, you know, what are those kinds of treatments that um, could we see more verbal communication? Could we see, you know, um, just it's it's unknown but it's guaranteed no if you don't have the right answer well i do not see any more questions in there aren't any questions in the q a and i don't see any more in the chat so i think that about wraps up our presentation. Angela, if people want to contact you, what is the best way for them to do that? Sure. So um, I'm an open book. I'm easy to find on the internet, but um, my email is Angela at IPUL, which stands for Idaho Parents Unlimited, IPULIdaho.org. That's um, my work address, but you could also Google I Idaho Parents Unlimited and find me that way. Um, that's, I'm easy to find. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for your time and your presentation. And um, we look forward to sharing it with more parents and providers in the future. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. We appreciate you. So thank everyone you. have a wonderful afternoon and we will have this video up uh, to be shared uh, probably within, by the end of the week. So thank you and goodbye.